Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Authority Talk Show Series. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you're having a terrific day. Again, as we always say here at the Gym Master Show Live, if you're not having a good day, we've come to the right place for smiles and great entertainment, great poignant conversations, and so much more as we're truly bringing back that lost art of conversation and style here on our Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show series. Wherever you're watching around the world, we thank you for your time. Thanks for all the great comments on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. There's so many we can't keep up with them. Thanks. We appreciate all that love, or as we call lovity here on the show. If this is your first time joining us on the Gym Masters Show Live, I am your host, Jim Masters. You guys that know this show regularly know I work in television, radio, station, film, and have for years. And this show is sort of like an off branch of those experiences. And our guests come in from Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, sports, culinary arts, comedy, inspiration, and everything in between, all about life. If you guys would like to comment, and I see a lot of comments built up already in the JMS Lovity chat room, as we call it, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's where we house all these episodes, some 730 episodes of our series and counting, which is hard to believe. That's a lot of talking. That's a lot of levity. <laughs> so if you would like to comment during the show in the JMS Levity chat room amongst each other, sometimes we'll show some of your comments on the uh, air on the screen as well. Happy to do that. Uh, just subscribe to the YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV, and click that notification bell so you never miss any of our episodes. And uh, when you click the notification bell, you'll be alerted to the episodes that are uh, coming up. We're really excited. Uh, we've got amazing guests coming up. Uh, Ava Cherry is coming up this week. Florence LaRue is coming up. Yes, we just had Melba Moore. Um, we've had Lucy Arnez on the show, Tony Orlando, Nathan Carter, of course, you know, the wonderful Irish country music star. He was just on uh, yesterday live from Ireland. It was his second visit on the Gym Masters show live series. So we welcome all of you from around the world. We are based here in the United States for the new viewers watching in the greater New York City area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, along the southern New England coast between New York and Boston. Beautiful day, 80 degrees, light coastal breeze in the summertime. You can't beat it. Wherever you're watching around the world, uh, we got a lot of viewers that watch here in the United States, Canada, Europe, Asia. Australia, Africa, we welcome you from wherever you are. We are also welcoming two friends of mine and two incredibly spirited, amazing people, super duper talents. You know, when we mentioned that Monica Mancini and Greg Field were coming on the show, it was like Christmas. Everybody was just like, oh, I love them. They're so talented. They're incredible. I follow them. I've worked with them. I've collaborated with them. I just enjoy their music and their material. Well, it's easy to see why, because they are super talents. Monica, of course, the daughter of film composing legend Henry Mancini, of course, double Grammy nominated vocalist herself, extraordinary, perfectly pure, beautiful voice. Greg Field, of course, and yes, they are a couple. They are husband and wife, <laughs> if you're wondering. Uh, Eight-time Grammy winning and Emmy winning record producer, musician, drummer extraordinaire. Uh, I don't think there's a piece of music he hasn't touched in his life. He's really he's prolific in terms of being a, an American record producer extraordinaire, but he's traveled around the world. He's worked with many, many well-known artists as well. The recipient, as I said, of multiple Grammy and Emmy Awards. Uh, it's extraordinary. Matter of fact, as of 2021, he is the governor of the Los Angeles chapter of the Recording Academy as well. And he has worked in toured or played for Ray Charles, Harry James, Mel Torme, Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra. Yes, and that's just the short list as well. As a Los Angeles uh, session musician, he's recorded albums with Barbara Streisand, Michael Bublé, Placido Domingo, Seal, Barry Manilow, Natalie Cole, Gloria Stefan, Barry Manilow, as I mentioned, uh, Arturo Sandoval, George Benson, Il Volo, uh, Bette Midler, <laughs> Vanessa Williams, I told you, Vince Gill, Amy Grant, Dave Cos, Dean Martin, uh, Shelby Lynn, Anne Murray, Johnny Mathis, Matthew Morrison, Patty Austin, of course, Monica Mancini, uh, Al Giro, Shelley Berg, Bob Florence, Tom Scott, 
and so many others. Uh, he's also performed with the Los Angeles Philharmonic, the London Symphony Orchestra, National Symphony, the Royal Philharmonic, the BBC Symphony, the New York Pops, Seattle Symphony, Detroit Symphony, the Czech National Symphony Orchestra, the Palermo Symphony, Dallas Symphony, Toronto Symphony, Detroit Symphony, Pittsburgh Symphony, Denver Symphony, just about every symphony gang, <laughs> Vancouver, Columbus, the WDR Symphony and Big Band and the BBC Big Band, Hollywood Bowl Orchestra, and so much more. He's also uh, performed for American presidents, Barack Obama and George W. Bush as well. And uh, he's worked with Stevie Wonder and Josh Groban and uh, Ariana Grande and so many others. And we'll talk about it. Aretha Franklin. I mean, the list goes on and on. Extraordinary and a prolific drummer as well. Again, he's been doing this uh, really since he was a kid and he's loved every second of it. Monica herself, let me tell you, she's an extraordinary talent as well. Concord Records recording artist, double Grammy-nominated vocalist, daughter of famed film composer Henry Mancini. She's carved out an impressive career herself as a concert performer, appearing with major symphony orchestras worldwide, including the Chicago Symphony, New York Pops, Boston Pops, Dallas Symphony, Seattle Symphony, and the London Metropolitan Orchestra. She began singing early on as a member of the Henry Mancini Chorus, which led to a successful career in the Los Angeles studios, where she appeared on countless film scores and recordings with such notables as Placido Domingo, Quincy Jones, Michael Jackson. Her debut CD, simply titled Monica Mancini, was the companion to her PBS television special, Monica Mancini on Record. She also released her fifth album, I Love These Days, a collection of classic 60s songs featuring collaborations with Stevie Wonder, Brian Wilson, Jackson Brown, and Take Six, arranged for full orchestra. To celebrate the release of the USPS Henry Mancini commemorative poster stamp, Monica kicked off an extensive 60s city tour, followed by sold-out concerts at Carnegie Hall, Disney Hall, Boston Symphony Hall, Tanglewood with John Williams, Boston Pops, and more. In 2016, she made her debut at the famed Apollo Theater in New York to help celebrate Ella Fitzgerald's 100th birthday. The New York Times has described Monica's rich, expressive voice as the glamorous vocal equivalent to diamonds flashing. Now, I mean, how do you tough that? That is exactly uh, correct. Spot on the New York Times. Uh, Monica and I, Greg and I, Monica and I, we all know each other. We actually worked on a public television special a few years back. But also, uh, Monica and I met, and Greg was reminding us, in 1998 when she came to the uh, PBS studios. And uh, she was, there we are, she was um, celebrating the music of her incredible father, Henry Mancini. She had a PBS special that was beautifully and well-received, and she was singing his songs and celebrating his life, which was amazing. So one of the many times we've had an opportunity to meet, and I got a chance to uh, host that evening uh, for public television, and she was our special guest in the studio. So we met from there, and then the rest is history. They really are very talented and wonderful people, again, with terrific backgrounds, but they've carved out their own niches in the music industry, and they've been rewarded um, gloriously for it. Not the reason why they do what they do. They do it because they love it. Uh, they're incredibly talented at it. And you know what? I can tell you personally, which whenever I know guests that are on our show or even in my professional world on TV and radio, I tell you, uh, you know, straightforward, they're very nice people. <laughs> they really are. And they're funny and uh, they have a wonderful relationship. And guess what? They are our guests right now, live from their beautiful studios there in Los Angeles. Welcome, my Hi. friends, Hi. Greg Hi. and Monica. <laughs> that that intro wore me out. <laughs> wow. It sounds like, first of all, it sounds like I can't keep a job. <laughs> I can't figure out why Monica looks exactly the same. Does well, it? From 24 years ago. My God, Jim. It's unbelievable, I tell no, you. No work. No work. Not at all. I, I Now, I have to say, because it is a special day, and we'll mention the special day, we just happen to be doing this on a very special day in your lives, in the lives of many. Uh, that, that thank you that you just said, Monica, reminds me of what I was saying before we went live, how we were all at Carnegie Hall together just a few years back, and our friend, composer Tim Janis, 
who puts on this beautiful concert performance in American Christmas Carol to support Kate Winslet's charity, uh, the Golden Hat Foundation for Autism Research. And you were there and your beautiful mom, Ginny Mancini was there. Sir James Galway, Lady Jean Galway were there and all of our other friends, Marie Nesbitt, everybody was there, Tim, of course. And I was tasked with being the master of ceremonies, but also writing the intros for all of the special guests. And of course, doing the clothes and greeting everybody, which was a great honor. And I wrote the intro for your mom, for, for Ginny. And it was my pleasure to do it. After when she came off the stage, when you go back through those big white doors that open up and you go in the back there with the crew, she came up to me. and It was almost like a high five. She said, Jim, right in front of everybody, I have never had an introduction like that in my life. Oh, my God. I don't even remember. I did half those things. That was incredible. <laughs> She was funny. She was real. She was smiling. And today is her birthday. It How is. beautiful is that, huh? Happy birthday, mom. Oh, yeah. do, do we want to sing happy birthday to her, uh, the three of us? Why do not? We well, I think it should be the two of you. <laughs> I, I really suck. You can, and, yes, can suck, honor along, of, suck along with us. All right, here we go. You got a couple of spoons with you or something, Greg? <laughs> you can do spoons. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you lead off, Monica. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, dear Jenny, Mama. Happy birthday to you. Very nice. Bravo. Bravo. Very nice. She would honor. probably say, you know, a couple of things. Yeah, a couple, that, of things, uh, yeah. couple of things. <laughs> you need a little more rehearsal on the bridge or something. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, but uh, yeah. really, really special and uh, glad that uh, we're doing it on this day. Um, how, how have you been? How, you know, since we chatted last, the world, you know, has oh, uh, gone in a lot of different directions on many different levels, but you guys have still been doing your thing, right? Greg, you were telling me that this mm -hmm. was one of the busiest periods you've experienced in a number of years, which is fantastic. Uh, yeah, no, it, it's uh, it's actually been uh, the last couple of years. Uh, they were a challenge, but you know, with us all at home and um, needing something to listen to, um, recorded music kept going. Uh, Monica was more negative, negatively affected because obviously live concerts came to a Just screeching halt, over. right? And so that's now starting to ramp up. Um, but yeah, I did a, actually did a lot of sessions remotely. So I'm here in my studio in LA and we were using the um, Royal Philharmonic or the London Symphony at a studio in London and I could hear them, I could see them and we could keep it going. And uh, thank God, you know, it kept us all um, out of the poorhouse. <laughs> Exactly right. Yeah, the home studio situation has become quite a valuable asset, and uh, that's what I did with this series too. Is doing it really out of the out of the house, and it just you know sprung up from this situation and just continues going forward from there. It's a beautiful thing. Speaking of springing up, uh, you guys early on. Um, I'll start with you, Monica. Obviously, growing up in the, the wonderful household with music all around you. Your father, the glorious Henry Mancini, never really imposed on, on you guys to have to go into music, right? You had an opportunity, if you wanted to go into it, to go into it, but it wasn't something where it was a mandatory thing. Tell us about no. the inspirations for you to, to want to go into it. I know your mother a wonderful singer herself, extraordinary, was also, most people would think your dad, which I'm sure, yes, but your mother as well, a wonderful inspiration for you, right? Well, yeah. I mean, that she was the reason that I, I became a singer. You know, my dad, if you ever heard him sing, he uh, he was not terribly good 
at it. And but mom, that's what she did for a living. And she did a lot of the old variety shows back in the 50s and 60s, starting with the Steve Martin, Steve Martin, listen to me, uh, Tony Martin okay, show and Danny Kaye and Judy Garland. And, you know, all of those shows that were on network television that filled the networks you know, in the, during prime time. And she was one of the sort of stable singers for a lot of those, those TV shows. And my sister and I have a twin, an identical twin. And she, when school was out, we would come home and she would take us to the studio with her to the, uh, Red Skelton. It's CBS studios now on, on La Brea. I think they were called the Red Skelton studios where mm. she worked on the Red Skelton <laughs> show. And I remember, you know, going in there with her and she'd get in the makeup chair with her other couple of singers that were there and then they put her in, in her costume and I thought wow I thought this is this looks like something I might get used to doing and so I really followed her into that whole field um you know I don't have the the gift of writing music I mean I've tried I'm, I'm really slow but it's not what it's not what comes naturally to me but singing does and so she she was my biggest fan biggest inspiration and you know back to dad he you know, we did the perfunctory piano lessons that every kid did when they grew up. But, you know, it, we went to um, Catholic schools and the music programs were non-existent back then. Mm. I hope that they've improved over the years. But yeah. um, so we, you know, he never, you know, he just wanted us, he just wanted us to be happy. <laughs> yes. but, uh, I never recall any pressure from him in one direction or another. I think he just saw at a young age when he started hiring me to sing in his chorus, you know, he thought he'd put me someplace with, with a lot of singers around so I wouldn't stick out like a sore thumb. And so <laughs> I got my feet wet really early and learned a lot just by doing and, you know, being out there on the road. And, and uh, it was kind of a foregone conclusion what I would end up doing um you know it was you know when he passed i was perfectly happy being in the studios and being a background singer and and doing all that great work and making all these wonderful friends and uh so i was afforded an opportunity when he passed away to start doing tribute concerts mm -hmm. in the symphony world and that's kind of how i started on my own it was never an intention of mine to go and be a soloist i it wasn't my thing but uh, it's now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and that was so great, Jim, because that's when we first met you when Monica did her PBS special. Right? That's you right. Were, yeah. And um, wow, you looked like a 12 year old with his own TV show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Wait, then or now? <laughs> well, let's you, start. You guys that. look great too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was incredible. And uh, I, I mean, I was really struck with your, how really good you were at doing, um, at hosting, you know, it's just, it's obviously in your blood. And now here we are, what, 24 years later, and we're, we're still it, doing it. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And uh, we on worked, network. yes, we worked uh, on the uh, special with Giada as well, the public television special from Venice wow. with Love. We did that together as well, oh, which was, which was awesome. And uh, so, yeah, we've had uh, our, our paths have crossed to many different levels, which I think has been absolutely really, really spectacular. How about for you, Greg? I mean, early on uh, the kid with his uh, drum set early, tell us about uh, some of the inspirations for you early on to want to go into music. I'll tell you a crazy story. So <clears throat> my parents were not uh, musicians. My father was a surgeon and my mother was a nurse. And I grew up in the East Bay, a little town next to Oakland called San Leandro. And um, I had been playing drums for about a year, kind of rock and roll drums. I was about 10 years old. And my parents would take my brother and I to Disneyland once a year. <clears throat> and this one year, um, there was a big stage. The curtain was closed. And I was standing there waiting to see who was going to perform and the curtains open up and it was Count Basie's band. And I'd never really heard jazz before. And I just, I remember having a physical reaction, the hair set up on the back of my neck. And I said to my dad, would you buy every Count Basie record you can find? <clears throat> and literally from the time I was 10 years old, I would come home and practice to these albums hours and hours and hours. And I did this for, you know, all throughout uh, elementary school, junior high school and high school. And so this is an incredible story, but it actually happened. Um, I was a senior in high school and Ella and Basie were going to perform at this theater for a week. And I asked my dad if he'd buy a ticket for me for every show. 
Yeah. And I would stand outside the stage door <laughs> and the band bus would pull up and I knew I could recognize everybody by name. Right. So I did this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, my girlfriend and I were going to go to a second show. She called me that afternoon and said, I'm not feeling good. I'm not going to go. So I thought, well, I've got nothing to do. So I bought a ticket for the first show. And like I did every other night, I'm standing outside the stage door. And one of the guys in the band stops and says, you work here? And I said, no. He said, well, why are you standing out here every night? Because I'm doing full on fanboy, right? Just yes. And, um, and he said, well, my name's John Williams. I said, yeah, I know you're John Calvin Williams. You joined the band in 1970. You play baritone sax and you're from Greensboro, South Carolina. And he went, wow. <laughs> okay, why don't you come back and meet the guys? So I go back and I meet all the guys, and it's about five minutes before the concert's going to start. And the whole band is assembled in the wings, and Count Basie comes up. Mm -hmm. And John said, uh, What's your name? And I said, Greg Field. I'm a drummer. And Basie, I spoke to Basie for a few minutes. The whole band goes and gets on stage, and as they're about to introduce Basie, the manager comes up and said, Hey, Basie, Sonny Payne's not here. Wow. And Sonny Payne was the drummer. Yeah. And Basie said, didn't you say you were a drummer? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you want to play? And I walked out on stage and I played the entire first half of the concert. Wow. Songs that I played in my bedroom yeah. hundreds of times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and somebody went and grabbed Ella and they said, hey, some kid out of the audience is playing drums with Basie. So I met Ella that night. And for the long answer to your question is... Um, <clears throat> I still need to look a little bit more. Oh, wow. That's me with Ella a few years later. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. That was my first night with Ella, actually. That's Joe Pass. Anyway, um, you know, I, I needed a little more seasoning. I ended up working for Ray Charles for a while and Harry James and Mel Torme. And then I was 24 years old. I was living in LA and the phone rang and it was Basie. And he said, you want to join my band? And yes. I did um, almost three, year, three years with him and uh, recorded my first album that won a Grammy. Yes. Uh, and then it kind of went, it took off from there. And he was even wearing the same color suit as the band. Oh, yeah, that was really was weird. So yeah. Just, yeah, you might have a picture of it. I think how I perfect, it. you know. Uh, there was a guy from San like Francisco. A brown suit or no, something. No, it was like a gray thing. suit. Oh, gray. Okay. But anyway, it's um, I don't believe <laughs> it. Shoes. You also worked with Sinatra. I did actually. That's um, that's the first time I worked with Frank. That's um, from an NBC special we did called The Man and His Music. And at that point, I was Basie's drummer. Um, and we did a couple songs with Frank and then um, left Basie to go with Ella and a couple years with Ella. And then um, Frank's drummer of 25 years, Irv Kotler, died. And they went through four drummers and two bass players in about six months. And I got the call. And it was almost exactly 10 years after that photo you're showing. And then I stayed with Frank till, till the very end. That's incredible, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a long time ago, and I know I did it, but my career moved so far away from that that it's kind of like, really, did that actually happen? Yeah, I know. You uh, also worked with, oh, no, this is a great shot. This is Julie uh, Andrews with Monica and your and sister. My twin, my twin yes. Is. Look at that shot, huh? What was this event, Monica? That was at the Hollywood Bowl. They were doing a tribute to... Uh, your dad, it, I think. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Your dad with, uh, with and Julie. John Williams conducted. Julie was uh, the mistress of ceremonies, and a lot of different artists performed. I frankly don't remember what. All I remember that that night is that I met um, Toby Bryant. So there's a picture of me with Toby. Um, Toby. Toby. Oh, to who's Toby? <laughs> <laughs> you know who I mean. Maybe his twin. <laughs> 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 yes, the Bryant boys. You anyway. know um, what? Julie Andrews is always the first to talk about is that when they were doing Victor Victoria, yeah, um, Monica sung all the demos for Julie, and she said, um, "You know, I just sang what Monica sang, which is pretty cool." Yikes! Um, That's amazing, yeah, huh? An honor. To yeah. Hear the pressure of just doing the demos for her and then having her learn them from what I did was. <laughs> that, but, that's that's pinch me moment type stuff. Yes. Oh, you're not kidding. That is really incredible. Um, I mentioned, too, you were talking about Count Basie Orchestra. So we've had a couple of different people who've been affiliated with Count Basie as guests on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, Scotty Barnhart. And, of course, there's Johnny Mathis. Uh, Scotty Barnhart, as well, was a guest on our show recently. One of the nicest guys on the planet as well. Uh, he's so great. You know, he's, he's running the band. He joined the band 
Uh, right after Basie died, and he's been there ever since, and he's been running it, I think, for about 10 years. But that was a session that we did. That's Capitol Studios. And Basie's band had never recorded a Christmas record. And Scotty called me and said, would you produce a Christmas record for us? And I was trying to figure out to do something different. Mm -hmm. And I called Mathis, who's an old family friend of the Mancini's, and said, would you be willing to sing on one track? And it was called uh, It's the Holiday Season. And I think last time I checked, just on Spotify, it had 8 million streams. It was a tremendously successful um, track. Very proud of that one. And of course, you know, Scotty's doing a great job with the band. Yeah. And again, just a really nice guy. We had so many great conversations. Um, you had an opportunity to meet um, Monica, somebody that I had always wished I got a chance to chat with. Um, just definitely Mr. Christmas, the one and only Andy Williams. Oh, <laughs> yeah, huh? <laughs> oh, no. Look at the smile on his face. Well, of yeah, course. Sandwich he's course. in. <laughs> yes, you're showing me. Where'd you get these pictures? Did Greg send these to you? Maybe I did. These I don't know. This one we dug up. You did a little research. Uh, Greg Aww. sent some nice, cool ones. We're showing, we're sprinkling in, and then we dug up a little extra surprises here. This oh this God. was great, huh? Wasn't he amazing? He was, you know, oh, Andy, man. you know, it, it's, it's hard to say who put who on the map, you know, if, yeah. if Andy hadn't recorded Moon River, it wouldn't have yes. been the success it was. And if dad hadn't written it, Andy wouldn't have had his first big hit. So it, it was a really lovely relationship. They worked a lot together. They were on the road forever together. Um, and uh, they were, you know, Andy Williams, what are you going to do? He's, he was great. Yeah. They had a really, really nice, nice, nice relationship. Oh, yeah. And he had the nice theater out there in uh, Branson, Missouri, uh, yeah. as well. Which, you know, for you uh, growing up, uh, what was it like? I would imagine you had a lot of fun. I mean, your mom's your mom, your dad's your dad, you know, brother, sister. As much as you know, there's a lot of incredibleness with all the music and all the folks. <sighs> uh, family is family, right? Oh. Yeah, um, we had a great upbringing and and as you said earlier on you know there was always music playing in the house it, not always dads but i mean it was you know we always had some you know west side story going on we were into musical theater so we had that and then the beach boys and the beatles were on you know ad nauseum and so the house was always filled with music and uh this shot you have here we it was their home in malibu we had a, a house on that beach since 65 i think and it was one of the few places dad went to just well look at him he's just kind of being himself and then he yeah, loved to yeah. me as well so we he bought a place in Vail Colorado many many in the 70s early 70s and that's his recreation was skiing or just being on the ocean um just he just it put a big yeah. smile on his face as it did with ours absolutely look what else, look what else we found here uh, -oh. uh, uh what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> this is your life. Uh, uh, Who you going to bring on, my young? Which, which one's which? I can't. Uh, I think we've got Aunt Blanche waiting in the wings. Remember Blanche? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. Yeah. She gave. Wasn't she the one that gave you the banana bread recipe? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we we, we used to. All kids did. You know, my grandma used to sew our costumes, which she did there. And, you know, we were in tap yeah. class. My mom loved tap. She was yeah. a tap from way back. And so oh, she, yeah. put, that is one thing she did do, put us all, even my brother, in tap shoes and in cotillion and doing all these crazy shows. Now that you mention that, it's like, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> um, pretty cute, though. We but were very cute. Tour. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I love it. It's a great family shot. Huh? Oh, that's yeah. nice. I love that one. Oh, this is like memory lane. I love I it. Yeah. We, we we like to throw in some levity here and there. A lot um, of 80s hair and, and shoulder pads. Was <laughs> that, that, was, that was that look. Look how great your mom looked in that I picture. Know, though. Wow, about it. that was incredible. You know, that picture was taken at the very last time my dad was at the piano. And we were doing a... This one here, yeah. Yeah. a um, Victor Victoria. A, no, 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 no. This was well after. It was a song that a, a, a woman was putting together a special book. And it was an AIDS related charity and they had different celebrities and their children or kin of some kind to just write show a picture and then just write something 
just special about their, their loved ones. And anyway, this was, I was doing the demo for this song that dad had written for this charity. And that was, he was, you know, kind of on the last, he, uh, he was almost on his way out at that point. So yeah. it was a really special day. And we all kind of knew that, you know, this was it. Yeah. And, uh, but he still got that smile on his face. Still you know? got that smile. Yeah. Man. What, uh, I mean, how would you describe him? How would you describe, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody has their version um, outside, uh, but you were inside. He was your, to you, uh, extraordinary film composer and so much more, but to you, he was, and will always be dad. How would you describe him from uh, your vantage point? Uh, well, you know, fa family, you know, La Familia, my mom used yeah. to always that, yeah. you know, pretty much everything to him. And he, he, you know, we, our family is kind of known for when he wasn't on the road and he was home on the weekends, we'd all go at his house and, and he'd make pasta for dinner. And he thought he was just the best cook in the land. And, <laughs> you know, uh, he, he was, it was edible, but he really fashioned himself as being a, a family man and a really good chef. And, and we just sat around the table and drank wine and just, just, we're a family. We just got off on being with each other and laughing our asses off. And, yeah. uh, I, you know, what can you say? He was warm and dear. And I think that's what the takeaway was with anybody who worked with him or even had an opportunity to spend time with him as they just remember him as being just the one of the great, lovely guys ever and very humble. You know, very humble. Really I'll, I'll tell you something apropos of that shot. That's obviously a session probably somewhere in Hollywood. And there's Ginny. Mm -hmm. And she was obviously in the, you know, the choir. You can see the singers back there. But there's something that 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 Henry used to do. <clears throat> you know, recording sessions are done in three hour mm -hmm. segments, right? So um, if you go even one minute past three hours, the musicians get paid an extra half hour. Mm -hmm. So uh, Hank had become so beloved and so powerful frankly that he would have all the music recorded within the three hours and then he would say you know guys take a 10 i just need to check something here and he would purposefully push the sessions over so that all the guys were paid an extra half hour and you oh, know wow. 50 musicians and then i'll tell you i had that same thing happen with michael buble oh yeah we were doing a record about five years ago and um we had one more song to record um, and the whole orchestra came in to uh, studio the next day and we had the song recorded in 45 minutes. Um, and he said to the music contractor, you know, what, what would it cost to uh, keep the guys an extra hour? And she said, Oh, I think it'd be around 15, $20,000. He said, okay, um, go ahead and give that to the guys and tell them thanks and let everybody go home. And sure enough, there was that extra hour and that's how Buble roll, rolls too. He's that sweet of a guy. Well, you know, dad always thought of himself. He never pulled rank and he was mm. one of the guys. He was a musician. That's what he loved. And he related to all the all of his musicians so well. And they all adored him because of that, because he wasn't, you know, up there with his baton and, and doing that conductor thing. He, he was one of the guys. And that's why he wanted to just be, you know, really generous to them. He, he knows what he went through and he, you know, these are working people and uh, oh, yeah. people think that you're in Hollywood and you're, you know, and you're making all this, this money and, you know, I mean, yeah, it's a good living, but it's not like, you know, they're going to retire on a yacht or something. And he, he, he wanted them, he, he, he just wanted them to work and to be happy. Yeah. And that's his thing. Which is incredible. And, uh, you're, you're both that way similarly as well. And, and having had an opportunity to see you guys in action and work with both of you. And, and there's a long list of people that probably would sign up on the same sheet that i'm signed up on that you're both very similar in that way you're 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 warm you like to have a good time i mean you're you're super talented in your own individual ways and collective ways but you like to make it an experience where everybody is finding enjoyment and joy out of the music making and that's really important right because i think when you master that atmosphere then you're going to get the best out of people aren't you Hundred yeah. percent. I mean, you know, it all comes down to, mm -hmm. um, for me, especially producing music, it all comes down to a reaction. Um, you know, joy, fun. When we're having fun, we should be having fun as musicians creating it um, or singing it, um, or it should rip our heart out. Rip, rip your heart out if you're, you know, doing something that's very emotional. But the, 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 the trick is to just get to the emotion: happy, sad, but some kind of reaction. 
Um, and, you know, when Monica sings on stage, she's she's got that ability to have you crying one minute and um, and laughing the next. Um, oh. But yeah, I, yeah, well, no, I mean, truly, it's a it's first time Monica and I worked together was the first time we met, which was in Tokyo in 1997, just over 25 years ago with her father's orchestra. That's right. Um, and I heard that I was hired as the drummer. And I heard that Monica Mancini, Henry's daughter, is the singer. It's got to be nepotism. Gotta be. <laughs> How <laughs> great could she possibly be? Not that there's anything wrong with well, that. Well, I'd say. <laughs> man, I heard her sing. And I thought, I had no idea that she was kind of the queen of the background singers in L.A. Oh. I mean, she did duets with Michael Jackson on the history record. She was, like, right up there. She was, yeah. And and then <laughs> uh, I know she denies it, but yeah, she was. And um, we spent a month in Japan together and I just fell crazy head over heels in love with her. And that was it. That was it. And was the same for you, uh, Monica? Not or really. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hell no. Not so much. <laughs> um, we laugh, you know, I, we just had a really good time together and we laughed at the same things and we thought, Oh, this is, this is working. This is going to, this is nice. Anyway. Yeah. So, you know, it just started with, Oh, the music does strange things to people. It does. Cause at first you weren't necessarily a fan of like solo drum situations, right? Oh, Monica? Please, please. Oh, hell no. I, you, know, I, you know, I will say that. <laughs> God. Oh yeah, bring me a drum solo. <laughs> but when I I it's the first time though I appreciated a drum solo and I could hear it musically because he he brought he made the drum set sing to me. It it became a musical Thank instrument. You. Um and before, you know, it's just banging and 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 so he he had me you know, I started to then listen to what people did on the drums and you can actually figure out whether <clears> they're <throat> any good, whether they're really good, whether they're, you know, they're coming through their instrument. It, it just was, it was enlightening to me to not have to plug my ears to, when I, you know, there was a drum solo anymore. So, which I still do because I think some drum solos are dreadful, but no, <laughs> no names, no names. No, no. Um, <laughs> but yeah. So, you know, I was That's not funny. a big drummer fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, so how did he win you over? What was it? I think it was just a love of a life, love of the same of thing. Yeah. You know? We, we just, it, 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 yeah, just a lot of things. It just, it just clicked in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we've been working at it ever since. It's not so hard work. 25 years. Yeah. Um, uh, and a lot amazing. of uh, 25 way, years. You, Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. You were kind enough to name all those symphonies that I've worked with. <laughs> all those symphonies were Monica's gig. I was just there as a music director or a drummer. Yeah. Get that um, straight, Jim. So yeah. It Isn't was that incredible. Uh, yeah. I mean, exactly. <laughs> I mean, you know, nobody hires a, well, actually I was hired one time by the New Jersey symphony to, um, to do something with them as a soloist, which I thought, why on earth would you call me to do that? But yeah. I was honored. Uh, but yeah, all those, all those symphony dates uh, have been Monica and, you know, um, with with 2024 coming up, that is will have been Henry's hundredth birthday, the centennial. Yeah. And yes. So, so we're now just starting in the first throes of ramping up a very large uh, tour of symphonies to celebrate her dad's music. That's They're incredible. Fun. That is yeah. fun. Congratulations on well, that. I'm looking forward to it. It'll be really nice. Yeah. For, for one thing. Yeah. Uh, yes. And to sing the music that that just moves me in every possible way. So, you know, I'm really lucky because singers need to look for material. I mean, and and they don't write it themselves. And uh, I have a little gold mine, or, you know, right, right at home. So I feel really fortunate that my situation is what it is. It's very, I have a, a lot of pride in what I do. Yeah. That music. Oh yeah, the, the music is, is golden. It stands the test of time. Whenever you hear any of the songs, I have a lot. I have a huge Henry Mancini collection of vocal, choral, and a lot of his instrumental too. Oh, yeah. His instrumental, even his Christmas music, spectacular. I yeah. mean, just all of it just has a certain feel uh, of of love and warmth, and just the amount of work when you really look back at his. Uh, 
archive, it's incredible the amount of music that he put out. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, you, really, you, you really got to know him through his music. I mean, you know, mm. Pink Panther. If you just p picture that, you know, that thing and, and the music that go uh -huh. along, goes along with it. And then you, it's so easy to see that my dad had written something like that because that's who he was. He was he had that, you know, that twinkle in his eye and he just what the hell is that? Okay. Pink Panther. <laughs> yeah, I know, but what is that look yeah. on his face? It's like <laughs> or his look, right? <laughs> but, you know, and then he was my dad was a romantic and and you know that obviously through Moon River and and just his his movie <clears throat> themes that were just so evocative and and it oh, just yeah, really wow. told you who he was as a as a guy and as as a human. He had a lot of humanity in his music. So yeah. you know there's a little a little factoid about about Henry uh his first big hit was the instrumental Peter Gunn, which was written for the TV sh series, obviously, right? And uh, in 1950, 58 or 59, it won the first Grammy for Album of the Year. And what a lot of people don't know is the piano player on Peter Gunn was John Williams, the John Williams, like yes. Star Wars John Williams. Yes. Henry's piano player, right? Incredible, actually. That's amazing, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Gee, when you think about it. And your parents, you know, as we said, it's your mom's uh, birthday today. They, the relationship between the two of them was really uh, very loving, wasn't it? And they, well, they, like, they like pizza too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't think that dress will ever be the same. After <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, dad's favorite song that he ever wrote was two for the road. And I think that it really spoke to, to their lives and they just had yeah. beautiful. And again, it was a professional relationship. It was just a love affair. Um, it was really, really great. And my, you know, she also brought my dad sort of into, I want to say society. That isn't really what I mean, but you know, he was very, very shy. Yeah. She kind of pulled him out of that and made him go to things and made him put a tux on and do these things. And, you know, he slowly kind of crept into the, the scenes, whatever they were, but um, they, they really made, it was a perfect balance with the two of them. They, they really worked great together and um, missed the hell out of them both. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Hey Absolutely. Jim, I'm watching these, these flashes come up with people all over the place. Yes. This is a really great show. I it's appreciate fun. that. It's really I wish I could fun. see it. Yeah. No, I mean, oh. like, I mean, just yeah, Pam just popped up there. There's Merlin. All the loveties. Yeah. Merlin. From watching yeah. from literally around the world. And newly, newly minted. Um, loveties. Lovety. Um, what do you call it? The, You're part uh, of our lovety family. No, no. Okay, but yet another squad. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're all commenting and loving it and uh, loving the photos and learning a little bit more, uh, which is great. And they're here all the time and it just continues to grow and blossom. We wow. uh, we dug up a fabulous photo here, too, as well with Barry Manilow. Oh, that's... Tell us about this friendship. Well, gosh. Yeah. That... I, I don't know. Did you know him before I did? Well, I, I knew Barry back in the 70s. Um, just through mutual friends and um, used to be social with him and then hadn't <clears throat> seen him for years. And I know that Greg was hired uh, to work with him as a drummer. Um, but, you know, I, one of my albums was called uh, the dreams of Johnny Mercer. And mm -hmm. I wanted to record this music because uh, Nancy Wilson had already had a record of this and, and Barry went, we were at his house and he gave me the demo of this, of this music that they did together. And Barry basically had written lyrics to unfinished um, music, rather to unfinished lyrics that Johnny Mercer had written. And Johnny Mercer's wife, Ginger, got in touch with Barry and said, I have this treasure trove of beautiful lyrics. And she asked, would you please look through them and put, put them whichever you feel to music which he did and so I did this whole CD of Manilow uh, Mercer songs and Barry came into the studio to kind of coach me and I learned and so much and co-produce yeah. yeah and one of the songs that I did was called When October Goes and that was probably one of those beautiful songs ever written with Mercer and Barry um, and he 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 showed me how to sing a song with without singing a song you know i was i was way too sing songy with this song and he says no 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 monica you got to be more what's the word i can recessive re, 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 speaking 
<laughs> he said it was he said it was a narrative. Yeah, it, he right? said you got to really this is a story. You got to really tell a story and and it he just I learned so much from him just in a short period of time in a studio and and how to communicate and and really to to look at what you're saying, write it down and look at yeah. the words and and make it mean something. And yeah. and he was a beautiful teacher in that regard. Oh yeah. For me. Um and, uh, you know, you learn, you and I learned from the best. Obviously. I think I've probably made 10, at least 10 records with him mm -hmm. since then. That was the right up. I think that was around 99, 2000. I made a record with him um, called Man of Sing Sinatra. And honestly, mm -hmm. with all those tribute records, I thought Barry's was the, the best of the bunch. He had really great arrangers, Patrick Williams, who was the arranger on Sinatra duets. Um, and it started a relationship that grew into a friendship outside of music. And we're still very close friends. He's great. He lives down in the desert, of course, and um, still is touring all the time. But, um, you know, I'm reminded of something that Sinatra said, um, talking about song interpretation. And it's really benefited me and as a producer. And he said, you know, I never let my singing get in the way of my storytelling. And that was the same message that Barry and Phil Ramon, who also worked with Monica, yeah. imparted. You know, and you think about singers like Frank, Ella, uh, Luther Vandross. Uh, I know you've got Ava Cherry coming on. Is that yeah. what you Yeah, yeah, okay. on Wednesday. Oh, okay. I've never met the woman, but I saw her so many times in concert with um, with Luther. And uh, But the thing is that, you know, these those three singers, Tony Bennett, they were sort of wired so that whatever came out of their mouth was filtered directly through who they were. Um, when Ella sang, they're writing songs of love, but not for me. She was lonely. I can tell you personally, I knew her yeah. away from the stage. And that authenticity is what um, I think Monica clearly has learned how to bring into her music now instinctively. And it, and it just makes it all the more enjoyable to work with a singer that can do that. And it's something that I think really, you know, comes from living life, right? The experiences that we have and, and wanting to share them through the music and sort of encourage and inspire, not just entertain, but sort of reach people at their core in certain ways. And, and we've been talking a lot of, on this show about kindness and empathy and, and how during the craziness of the last few years, people have been turning to music and nostalgic TV shows and old movies and, and baking the banana bread. I think you were just doing that an hour ago, right? The banana bread. <laughs> 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 Should have done the show there. I would have got a nice slice with some no butter. <laughs> next time, next that. time we're coming there on location to do it. And no, I'll bring okay. the wine. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. We oh. had a segue. We're going to introduce something to you, oh. and your audience, and your oh. fellow. Loveities. Loveties and wine lovers. No, what's the yes. lovey squad? Squad, thank you. God, I can't... <laughs> okay, here it comes. Well, before you show it, so Monica and I no, I made a deal that. with now. This... Can't you do like a, an oral drum roll for this? Uh, I bet you can do that too, right? <laughs> for the announcement there we go <laughs> um no we, we've got our own wine wow and it's it's being uh, basically put together by no less than bill harlan's team you know uh, the harlan estates yes look at and this so, close up of this let's see go up a yeah. little bit can you see that Wait. there amazing and you see what it's called it's called my Huckleberry well, friend. My Huckleberry friend. Yes. And that's our own label and our own wine. And we're going to open that tonight in Ginny's honor. I oh. wish she had just stuck around long enough to see this. But no, we can't it. sell it. So this isn't a pitch. No, no, no. Oh, that's not something that's going to be available. No. No. Because you know our loveries are going to want to place orders tonight. <laughs> they're they're very proactive. They're wow. going, wow, and yes. Oh, I love and, Sherry. Yeah, yeah, Sherry. Thank Bring you. it on. <laughs> I got some jewelry in uh, my pocket. Just hang on. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. So how did that all develop, the wine? Oh, it's too long a story. We like to drink wine, and that's how it developed. Well, okay, I'll make it quick. So well, Maureen in Arizona says this needs to be available to the Lovely Squad. <laughs> they want the wine. <laughs> I've got to work something out on the side. Yeah, the side. Um, right. No, there's this like crazy high-end um, 
wine club called the Napa Reserve up in St. Helena. And basically you join the club and they give you your own rows of grapes and they, uh, they harvest your wine and they bottle it. Um, and we did a concert for them um, for the 2019 harvest and they were, they made us members of the Napa Reserve. So we get access to this crazy great wine. That That's is so story. cool. Wow. Yeah. That is awesome. Congratulations on that and enjoy toasting tonight. A well, uh, you know, deserved reason for that. I, I also want to make mention too, because I know you're very proud of these recent works, Greg. Um, talking about Ella, this here, the Irving uh, Berlin songbook, Ella at the Hollywood Bowl. Tell us about this. Well, well, congratulations. Thank you. thank you, Jim. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, well, you know, I worked with Ella uh, for a couple of years and then subsequently um, I've produced um, her TV special, the 90th birthday special for, for PBS. And then That's uh, right. when she turned 100, I produced the Apollo Theater 100th birthday concert. So I've had this, this long um, love affair and relationship with the estate. And a couple of years ago, I got a call from Verve which was one of her labels. And they said, you know, we want to find something that might be in the vaults that you could release. Oh, that was, that's one of my proudest moments to be mm. invited by the Apollo Theater to do uh, the 100th concert. That was amazing. Unbelievable. Anyway, so I went through the vaults, a guy named Ken Drucker and I, Ken's the number two over at Verve. And we found two tapes that had never been released to the public. First one was called uh, Ella um, Live in Berlin 62. And it was at, with her trio, and it was an absolutely stunning performance. I can't believe it was never released. So um, <clears throat> I was able to use some modern technology and actually mix it as a recording, and we released it. Blew up all over the world. Um, and then they said, well, what else you got? And we discovered this tape that was a mono recording from the Hollywood Bowl from 1958 with a full orchestra. And it's the only time that she performed the uh, songbook, any of the songbook albums live where it was recorded. And um, I went in, uh, again, was able to use some modern technology to kind of bring the recordings up to date, you know, sonically, like, like the way we like to hear things now. And um, it came out about three weeks ago on, on Verve. And if you're an Ella fan, boy, don't miss this one. It's fabulous, yeah. actually. That is so fantastic. Yeah. There we go here. Look uh, at this. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, we finished that concert and uh, one of the reviewers was there from Downbeat Magazine. And he said, you know, I've been going to live jazz concerts for 50 years and this is the greatest concert I've ever seen. And we felt it. You know, you walk onto the stage of the Apollo and, and the ghosts of the greats attend every performance, right? Mm, and yeah. You know, right before the curtain opened up, and we had we had Scotty Barnhart and the Basie Band. Yeah, right. And I'm I was right in the middle of the stage because I was music directing and playing. And I looked and I thought, wow, there's the spot on the stage where 20th century and 21st century music changed forever. It started at that moment, and it, I got really emotional thinking about the impact that night had. Um, but yeah, it's um. That was a good one. And Monica sang that night. It was incredible yeah. to hear her on the stage yeah. of the Apollo. Absolutely. Really cool experiences. And, and you know, this is memory-making stuff we're talking about here. So yeah. is, um, let's see, something else we dug up here. Uh -oh. oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> How cool. Um, we do our research. Um, <laughs> you know, it's the only album I ever released under my own name. It was actually a pretty good little record. We did it back in um, 97. And um, the great Sammy Nestico came in and arranged it. And I had worked with him with Basie years before. And he came in and conducted it. And, uh, you know, that little... Look at that brown hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny how... I got married right after that, and my hair oh, started to change. And the, tear, the hair sort of became a little lighter? Or... Yeah, that's my gift. It's yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, That's a fun record. I haven't heard uh, it in years, God almighty. Absolutely. That's funny. Um, this is a great shot, too. Oh, God. What are you doing? I Look at all know. those symbols. My God. Well, I got, I got, that's, that's my Concord <laughs> Records shirt. 
And we decided that looked like a handicapped parking zone oh, logo. It does. <laughs> yeah, it really does. I think I was at some, <laughs> I was at some trade show trying out symbols, but um, wow. Have you ever even seen that picture? Yeah, unfortunately, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah. Oh, thank there you we go. For that picture. Oh, that is the Apollo. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, that's that's that night at the Apollo, and um, that's the great Nathan East on bass. And oh, uh, he's terrific. Yeah. Shelly Berg, of course, playing piano. Shelly, yeah. Brian Nova's our guitarist, and there's the Count Basie band back there with with uh, some hardcore seen there seen it all uh, done it all new york strings oh, yeah. and they were just blown away at the um at that concert mm -hmm. you know somebody snapped that picture and it mm -hmm. looked almost like the spirit of ella and joe pass mm. emerging from the stage it was really remarkable actually yes doesn't it yeah how yeah. cool is that I, really cool you, you never know, right? You, you never know. You never know. It yeah. could have been a, a little sign there. You've also worked with this gentleman. I know you, you're proud of a lot, but uh, this was quite recent, and you're ultra proud about working with Jonathan Antoine. Oh, mm -hmm. am I ever. Yeah. Um, you know, for your audience that, that might not know him, uh, Jonathan is a British tenor. Um, yes, he's 26. I was actually on a Zoom call with him this morning for our new album. Oh boy, and, um, we've done. Um, we did. This was the first album I did with him, and um, we also did a PBS special. Um, we did a subsequent Christmas record called Christmas Land, mm. and um, we're now uh, Diane Warren, the great songwriter. Oh from, yes, completely fell in love with Jonathan, and we're doing an entire album of Diane's music with Diane and Jonathan uh, and I presenting Jonathan. Um, couldn't recommend that album more um, to your listeners. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Great record. And he's a, an amazing young man. Um, With quite a story too. A, quite a journey in his life, right? A very inspiring oh, journey. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know what? Uh, your your listeners, um, audience might remember it. He was 16 years old. And he was on Britain's, Britain's Got Talent with a, a young, another young girl that went to high school with him named Charlotte. That's and right. um, Simon Cowell said, you're great. Lose her. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was really horrible. <laughs> um, but poor Jonathan, you know, he was um, really obese when he was in high school yeah. and he was horribly bullied. And then you could imagine when he got on TV, social media really went after him. Yeah. And um, he talks about this publicly. So I'm not talking out of school, but right. he was signed to Sony and the head of Sony worldwide, Howard Stringer invited uh, Jonathan to perform and um, it just was too much for him. And he had a nervous breakdown and uh, basically his whole career fell apart. Mm -hmm. I met him five years later and he had really gotten himself together. Um, and we went, I went over to London and recorded um, him live with the, um, with the Royal Philharmonic actually at air studios and Abbey road. And um, the results speak for themselves. And I'm so proud to be working with this guy. That Thanks. is so. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. No. Yeah. I, I remembered that. And, uh, you know, if you bump into him again, he's it'd be a joy to have him as a guest on our show and celebrate him more, tell his story uh, and, and talk about, like you just said, that new uh, project that's coming up, which is really, really exciting. I mean, you guys, you always have your hands in so many different things. And I think that's so fantastic. You're always working with others and uh, lifting other people up at the same time, doing what you do. So, uh, so beautifully, which I think is a really cool thing to be able to do. You know, not everybody gets a chance to do that. And the two of you get a chance to do that in such an extraordinary way. And yeah. you've got fabulous albums out yourself, oh. too, that people can uh, definitely scoop up. Monica, right? Huh? Yeah, scoop me. Yeah. Scoop me up. You know, that, <laughs> that beautiful photo was a casual <laughs> somebody took on a, we were standing in a garden in Florence, Italy, and somebody snapped that picture. Wow. I mean, just really by chance. Yeah. I always love that picture. Yeah, it's nice. Oh. oh, that's, 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 this one yeah. is one of my favorite recordings, yeah. actually. I just, Cinema uh, do so, yes. It's so gorgeous. And I, you know, extraordinary I, version. Yeah. I only did one song of my dad's in this because it, it's, it's such a great piece of music. I, it, it eludes me right now what the heck it was. But, a Soldier in the Rain. Ah, uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> there are so many beautiful, 
movie themes out there. And I said, I got to, I got to record other music other than my dad's, which I have on three other albums. So that's, but you know, I'll, that, that, that was my very, very first recording. Yes. Yeah. That was the big, yeah, that Jim, was, you uh, know that one. Well, you helped. Yes, him. that's that? right. Yeah. That was, uh, yeah. A lot of those went out the door that night. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> as long as they didn't come back in the door. We're right. Back. And there's the Johnny Mercy we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Look at you. That's a whole collection here. I was going to say, so cool, huh? Really? And there's oh, Columbia oh, yeah. Artist Presents, Man Mancini at the Movies. Yeah, that was a bit yeah. of a PTSD, I got to tell you. With that 60 City Tour. Yes. Oh, God. In 10 weeks. And, you know, uh, we... We just got off that bus and said, we're too old for this. You know what? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, I tours mean, for Touring you. is for the very young or younger than us. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's brutal. But, uh, you know, we put some miles oh, on. That's a new oh, one. Oh, yeah, with Taylor. Yeah, um, maybe your, some of your listeners know Taylor Dane. Yes. Yes. Well, she has sold 75 million records. Taylor Dane. And you know, uh, I tell you how this, how small this world is. We just had on the show and he was referred by Ed Rossetti, okay. fabulous drummer, um, who I think also was referred by Paul Zolo. Uh, Kenny Etchison, who is the drummer for Taylor on the West coast, I believe part of the West coast band. Okay. Kenny, I, yeah. I don't know her band out here. I haven't. Kenny Etchison, yeah, and he yeah. mentioned Taylor. Yeah, great, great talent, huh? Well, you know, she was on the Mass Singer, and uh, I hadn't right. heard her singing in years. And uh, her management reached out to me and said, "Would you take a listen to her?" And I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. And they said, "Well, you know, what would you do with her?" And I said, "Well, um, I get her away from Tell It to My Heart because that's." back then and what do you do that's now? right tell it well, to i'm later. taking her down the sort of amy winehouse uh ed sheeran very yeah. autobiographical songs with an acoustic rhythm section and mm. it that that picture was taken at capitol we were listening to our first playback and it was working and she got very emotional at that point well oh, i can imagine her talent you know those other records were very dance centric you know yeah. and driving beats and a lot of echo and and this really features her spectacular voice um oh, man. and she's front and center on this one it's really great that and is she's fantastic crazy yeah. fun to work with too oh i don't doubt it crazy. <laughs> 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 you know, it's so funny because, you know, when you're getting, oh, that's a nice photo. That's Prague, right? That was Prague. That was Prague, yeah. Yeah, Prague National Symphony, the Prague Proms, they call it. And, uh, yeah, we're doing them again, I think, uh, 2024. I hope oh, so. you are? Oh, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah. That is awesome. What was that like for you, Monica? That was really unbelievable. The, these, the musicians over there just have this whole other, how can I, um, Working work ethic. I don't. I not that people here any in the states don't, but it was just very different working with them. And they were, they sat and appreciated. And and um, I don't know. I, I just thought it, it was just a whole different vibe working over in Europe um, with these masterful musicians. Mm. Um, and uh, it was it was. I don't think I'd worked. I'd worked in the UK a few times, but I've never really done anything in Europe that I recall. And it was just this very form, this beautiful surrounding, this old, you know, thousand year old, thousands of year old, you know, wherever the hell we were, but the hall. It was actually about 200 years old. Oh, uh, 200. Yes. So what was it? Oh, the city is thousands of years old. Yeah. The two of you would be awesome on a game show together, <laughs> helping each other. Right. Was it 100 years or 200? No, it was 100. It was 200. Sorry, time's up. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually whatever she says. What? Yes. yes. Good boy. Good boy. <laughs> that is funny. I heard the greatest definition of um, <laughs> how do you keep a successful marriage? You compromise. You learn to compromise. And so like if your wife wants a cat and you want a dog, you compromise and you get the cat. Duh. <laughs> Come on, laughing. Come on. We're exactly laughing. right. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Up on the screen See, there. 
thousands of years old, doesn't it? Sure, it does, darling. Sure, absolutely. I would absolutely oh, yes. I'm in the middle of this. <laughs> speaking <laughs> speaking of well, uh, I thought that here's a perfect segue, huh? Uh, speaking of things that are, or in this case, people, just about one hundred years old, Mister Norman Lear. Oh, uh, oh collective, uh, yeah, Army. God, huh? You know, yeah. he posted something. He posted something. Uh, it was a little video. I don't know if you guys saw it. I think it was last summer, and it was fantastic. He was, I believe, he had that traditional hat on, the trademark hat, uh -huh. and I think he was in just a regular t-shirt type thing, and he was on a rocking chair at the family home in Vermont, yes. which was his and his wife's for years. And now the kids mm -hmm. pretty much have it and operate it. And he's just, it's just him holding his cell phone, very basic, not the usual television work we're all you know used to from Norman. And uh, he's sitting in the rocking chair. It's a summer day. He's talking to the phone and he's looking out at the beautiful Vermont countryside and he yeah. turns the phone around and he goes, look at this. This is my view. He said, I'm 99. I'm 99. He said, this is my view in Vermont right now. I'm at the house that was my wife and mine for years. Our kids now run it. Well, he is. He is there. Life is good. As we is there anybody better than me? Oh, and, that's oh, all yeah. he, and, that's, and that's all he said. And he was yeah. smiled. And that was a short you know, 30 second video. And that's all he did. What a fantastic thing to be able to do at 99. God bless him. Huh? Like watch it. He'll put out the same one in two days. Yeah. He, he turns, turns 100, 100 in two days on the 27th of July. And, and we had dinner with him about a week and a half ago. Oh, God. And he's um, the, the Mancini's and the Lears go back to the late fifties. Right. Oh, um, that I didn't know. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Tell us about well, you know, we we all were, you know, uh, you East Coast and otherworldly people. The San Fernando Valley is is where our home is and where I was raised and grew up. And Norman and his wife at the time, Francis, and a guy named Bud Yorkin, who was his TV partner and her wife, Peg, and my mom and dad were the six of them were all kind of valley friends. And we used to all get together at each other's houses, barbecues and whatever. And uh, the joke was that... Um, Everybody, no one had made it in the business yet because we were still in the valley. And um, so dad had his first hit with Peter Gunn and it he it his career took off and he was the first one to move out of the valley over to the, you know, the other side of the, the hills of Beverly. And, you know, Norman and Bud said, oh, we're, you know, we're right behind you, Hank. And anyway, <laughs> but they, they go back, they have so much history together and they all saw each other's successes right around the same time. And it was just so, such a beautiful thing. And our families have remained friends for all, you know, since the, I won't tell you when I was born, but back, way back then. And <laughs> and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some Norman Lear breaking news. So I'm going to be music directing an ABC two-hour primetime special coming up on September 8th called 100 Years of Norman Lear. And boy, have we got some great Oh, support. my God. Wow. Yeah. That is incredible. What honors, huh? What yeah. honors. The two of you, you're so good at what you do, and people just enjoy your personalities and working with you, and you make it look so easy. Any of us that are in any of these sort of creative roles, public figure roles, what have you, know all the blood, sweat, and tears, know the intensity, know the, you know, the sleepless nights, the travel, mm -hmm. all that comes with it. But if you love what you do, people gravitate to it. They want to consume it. They want to be a part of it. They want to work with you with it. And that's why your phone's always ringing for from Monica, for Greg, because you guys not only get it done, but people enjoy your company and you're so extraordinarily talented. I, I can't tell the viewers how many times I've seen your names, uh, you know, on the credits of things. And, and Greg, like Greg was involved in that. Greg was involved in that awards show and this and mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, oh my God, I thought I didn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the best part is that you know, we both love what we do and we get to do it together. I mean, this is, the, this is the, the ultimate joy. Um, yeah. and we don't, you know, get on each other's nerves much. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, what was that? Look, I saw that. 
We we just she saw that while looking straight at me. She saw that. <laughs> she can feel it. I <laughs> we just have fun together, you know. We just yeah. Oh God, we we love it. If we if a gig comes up, we love getting on the road. Not that early, but I mean, we love getting up and packed and go and do the gig. And you know, it's really fun. It keeps you young. Yeah. Isn't that a beautiful time in your lives, right? Really, where you're oh, able to do yeah. it together and enjoy and sort of understand each other in the way that you do. Although yeah. Sherry Larson in Kansas does say the wife is always right. So that's right. Yeah, okay. That's right, Sherry. Sherry, you, you go. You are so right. She's like oh <laughs> that's it, right? Yeah. Uh now, here's some more things you've been involved in. Of course, the fabulous National Christmas tree lighting ceremonies and, um, you know. Yeah, I did. You know, I did eight of those. Uh, yes. Either music directed or produced uh, the National Christmas tree lighting uh, all under the uh, during the Obama years. And um, <clears throat> we actually, <clears throat> excuse me, had one show. It was so sad. It was called Musica Latina. We were celebrating um, great Latin music. And, you know, when you do a White House show, this was going to be a um, in performance at the White House. And we had Gloria Stefan and Ricky Martin and Alejandro Sanz Natalie. and Natalie uh, uh, Cole. Cole. I mean, it was an incredible show. And, you know, he, as you know, Jim, it, it takes forever to put these things together. And we got to D.C., yeah. the camera blocked. And we <clears throat> the morning of the show, we were in the East Room, got everything ready to go. Uh, left for a quick dinner break and I get this text from the White House saying call us immediately and I call them and they say the president is canceling the show and it was the day of the, the Navy Yard shootings oh, yeah. and that wonderful show never got, we never, we didn't tape it uh, it just all came to a grinding halt um, but yeah the White House shows are nothing like it haven't you done the uh, the Fourth of July celebrations too? Have you been involved in those or the Memorial Day, that. Capital Fourth type stuff? Her father well, used to do that. Daddy, yes, your father. Yeah, mentioned right. James Galway, and they used to do the Capital Fourth all the time and doing their their uh, what's the thing when he plays the oh, the, the piccolo? What's oh, the, right? The, Stars and Stripes or whatever. Yeah, Stars and Stripes. One of those yeah, Fourth exactly. of July <laughs> songs. Anyway, so we used to spend a lot of time in D.C. with Dad because that was a thing he did every year. Um, yeah, we love that, was, it. that was really fun. I, I still do some of the um, Library of Congress Gershwin Prize. Um, that's that's what he won his Emmy for. His, that's uh, right. His, yeah. That's right. Fun. And also Latin Producer of the Year Grammy, right? Yeah. Imagine. Isn't it? <laughs> Speaking of Spanish, darling. No, nobody was more. Gregorio <laughs> Field. Uh, I know. You know, yeah. my name in, in Espanol is Del Campo. It means the field. So, See? I'm telling you. So I'm going to I'm gonna switch it over whenever I'm working with a lawyer. Whatever you <laughs> Yeah, you know what? It was completely by accident. Oh, but now, okay, that's that's at the Apollo. That was a rehearsal for the Ella show. It is? Actually, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see Apollo there on the drums. Yep. <laughs> uh, right. Monica is learning along with us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, that's you at Carnegie Hall. That was one of the funniest concerts I have ever done. <laughs> not on purpose. I, This man. It's Michelle Legrand. It's Michelle Legrand. I know who it is. <laughs> we, we did a couple of duets together, and he's so very French and yes. very emotive. And we were doing How Do You Keep the Music Playing? And I could barely contain myself because I started to laugh because he was, how do you keep the music playing? <laughs> Dramatic. Oh, I was like, oh, my oh my God. God, are you kidding me? But anyway, it was, a, it was a thrill to sing with him, but it was funny as hell. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you had all you do you could do to keep the uh, the straight face. I would that's imagine, right. huh? That's right. Uh, oh, where'd you get that? Did I send that to you? You know, I think this uh, one you did. Yes. This is. Um, yeah. I'm so proud of this. Um, that's Annie Fried Lingstadt from ABBA, the brunette in ABBA. That's and, right. Uh, Monica and I have known her for oh my god, 15, 20 years, and I literally for fifteen years I tried to get her to go in the studio, and I finally did it. Um, about three or four years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, she lives in Mallorca, Spain. So we flew over there, 
and um, recorded um, a track for a, a duet record I did for Arturo Sandoval. And uh, that was it. She had not been in a studio in many, many years. And that's just before they all went back in mm. to record the, the new Voyage album yeah. uh, that came out this past year. Mm. That is fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. Another look at this group. Wow. Well, yeah, they honored that. They honored my mom at the Wallace. The Wallace is a beautiful performing arts theater here in, in Beverly Hills. And um, all the everybody came out for this one. And uh, oh, it was real. John conducted, John Williams conducted. And, you know, he was telling a story about the fact that, you know, mom, as I said, used to be a studio singer way back in the day. And John was the piano player. And he admitted that he had, he had the hots for her back in the day. Yeah. So he, was, he was telling the guys said, God, she's really hot. What is, you know, and that you, they said, Hey, you better hands off. He, you know, she's married to the, to the conductor, to your boss, to your boss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go way back together. And Julie, of course, is a dear family friend and and she you know was there to honor mom and the best everybody came out oh. yeah and kristen chenoweth there and yeah yeah, yeah. ricky minor who's a very well-known um yeah well, ricky minor and i you know we both music direct and i was the producer and the music director on that show and wow. they went to take the shot and all of a sudden ricky comes up and jumps in the shot and i said what are you doing here you, you had nothing to do with this show well, <laughs> good picture. Great picture. You awesome. got the great picture out of it. True, right? Exactly. Uh, is that, is that uh, Michael that Bublé? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was. Um, you know, it was kind of. There was a very bittersweet moment. Um, <clears throat> that was the Tony Bennett Library of Congress Gershwin Prize, mm -hmm. and um, a, two or three years before that, it was 1990. I, I mean. Um, 20, no, 2000 something. No, wait a minute. It was Tony's 90th birthday right. mm. special. It was at, um, and I had just done this record with Michael and it was about to come out. And we were at uh, Radio City for Tony's 90th birthday. And two or three days later, Michael got the word that his very young, I think, three year old son had cancer. And the entire two year <laughs> tour was canceled. Um, and you know, he, Michael took it really hard. I remember and, that. Yeah. He reached out to him and said, listen, Michael, would you be willing to come and sing on Tony's special? He flew out from Vancouver, walked in, did the rehearsal, did the performance and didn't even stay for the, the finale. He got back on an airplane and went back and he was mm -hmm. there just for Tony. And wow. he, was, he was incredible. Yeah. That is absolutely. Yeah. What a beautiful story, too. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, great show. yeah, we did a um, we did a standards record about three years ago uh, with Seal. Um, you know, loved seeing the Great American Songbook, um, and that's us um, at the session. I was I was at that point I was only hired as a as the drummer, but he he kept singing the wrong lyrics, and mm. he's got a sense of humor, so I kind yeah. of kept, kept giving him a hard time about it. And when the album came out, he gave me a uh, producing credit for for all the vocals, <laughs> <laughs> I did not deserve at all. But he's a, he's a lovely guy, and it was a really good record, actually. Oh, uh, mm. yeah. Oh man, that's Placido Domingo. Yes, you don't recognize him. I'll tell you a really quick story, and I think you'll find this hysterical. I finally convinced him <clears throat> to record Granada, his mm. big hit. But I wanted him to do it with authentic flamenco musicians recorded in Madrid, and then we would put the orchestra on it, right? So I did a mock-up of the recording, and the first uh, opening he had to record was in New York. Um, and we got to the studio. I meet him for the first time, and he does two or three passes of Granada, mm -hmm. and he doesn't sing the last note. He just gets sings the whole song, but doesn't sing the G at the end, right? The money note. The money note. And he said, oh, he says, Gregorio, I'm so sorry. He said, I'm opening at the Met tomorrow night. You know, uh, if I give you the G, it might make it difficult for me to sing. Can I give it to you later? And that was in April. And the next opening was in Madrid in June. So I flew over to Madrid. Monica and I went over there. We got in the studio. Everything was great. And sure enough, he got to the very end. And he wouldn't sing the money note. 
And he said, oh, Maestrissimo Gregorio, I'm so sorry. He says, I'm going to be at Real Madrid for my 75th birthday. It's going to be 100,000 people, and I, I have to sing 15 songs. He says, I promise I'll give you the note. Can I give it to you later? <laughs> so what are you going to say, right? Uh, I said, well, sure, of course. So the next opening was January in Vienna. Mm. So I get on an airplane. I fly all the way to Vienna. And I know that he really likes Rioja. So I got this great bottle of Rioja mm. there early, put it up on the, you know, on the control, uh, on the, near the control console. And it's like 15 minutes before he's due there. And I get a text saying, Maestrissimo Gregorio, Maestro Domingo is so sorry. He has to postpone. And I have to postpone like for an hour or for, you know, God knows when. Anyway. There seems to be a theme running here with these postponements. Oh, and <laughs> so finally, he, comes, he walks in the studio, and he's in a great mood. And I said, Placido, do you mind if we start at the end? And he, he laughed and said, no, don't worry. I don't have to sing tomorrow. And he ended up um, taking five passes at the whole song. Wow. One was as good as the next. Yeah. And he kept looking at the bottle of Rioja. And um, about halfway through the session, I said, um, should we open this up and we can drink it after the session? And he said, why wait? <laughs> why why anyway, so <laughs> if you have a chance, if your audience uh, want a really great experience, it's it's um, Arturo Sandoval and um, Placido Domingo singing Granada. It's a really fun track. That's incredible. What a great story attached to that, huh? <laughs> the Gene heard. The G not heard around the world. The G not heard around the world. Look at this shot. Oh, man. I had just told Stevie that I used to date a woman that he ended up marrying. <laughs> and he's, and no, no, I've, I've worked with them for years, and I've never told him this, but back when I was with Basie, we were playing a concert in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Miss Arkansas, Len Cola Sullivan uh, was introducing Basie, and I just was enamored with her. And I dated her for a few months. And then years later, she ended up marrying Stevie. And we had, that was from, um, that was from the. Uh, Arturo's record. No, it was either Arturo's record, that same duet's record, or maybe the Basie Christmas record. Or anyway, whatever it was. And I said, hey, um, how's Len Cola doing? And he said, you know her? Mm. Call her. I said, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I dated, I dated her before you did, and he thought that was the funniest thing he'd ever heard. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's that, the funniest thing he's ever heard. No, probably not. No, that but is, he, 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 yeah, that's Len Cola and Stevie. <laughs> what a story, you know, huh? He's, um, I think, you know, of all the people I worked with, uh, yeah. I think I'm probably most proud of, of the many times I've been able to get in the studio with him. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's interesting. Uh, he and the older guys uh, want to be produced. They, they, you know, it was the same thing when Brian w Wilson recorded with Monica on um, God Only Knows. They did, they redid it. And I was looking at Brian and he just had his eyes on me the whole time. And he kept saying, is that okay? Is that Okay. And Stevie was the same way. We, we recorded Moon River with Stevie for um, the Ultimate Mancini record. And it's the first time I'd worked with him. And I was a little, you know, I didn't know if I could say anything to him. And he was kind of playing it kind of harsh. And I said, um, I thought, well, what am I going to do? I got to say it if it something about it. So I said, Stevie, I said, it needs to be more romantic. And he, and he was, oh, thank you. You know, um, and he, these guys come from an era of a uh, relationship with the producer that's um, just not seen that much anymore, actually. It's valuable and uh, sometimes intangible, but crucial. Exactly. Yeah. That's Look cool. at this shot. Oh, you want to talk about it? <laughs> well, what's to say? I mean, it's <laughs> <laughs> that's Brian Stokes Mitchell. And we were doing a uh, thing actually with, with uh, John Williams at the, for the Boston Pops. And it was a, it was a film night doing PBS with Scorsese and John as being because John does all of no no I'm I've got this backwards. It was a Spielberg Scorsese evening. Mm. 
That's yeah, right. I don't know. It was a long time ago. Quite an and, evening to have those two. Yeah, it was terrific. And John was, you know, conducting the Boston Pops, and and that's Patrick Williams, a dear, dear friend who's one of the greatest arrangers in Hollywood history. Absolutely. And uh, we're doing a rehearsing a Moon duet River. of Moon River um, that is wow. pretty friggin' gorgeous. That I just yeah. love singing with him. He's yeah. quite a yeah. talent. Absolutely. How the hell did you find that picture? That is so weird. Oh, anyway. I tell you, yes. Yeah, K or Dane again. That was taken. Yeah. We were right here in the same place. So, yeah, she said. So I tell you, it's really amazing. Uh, the, the, the amount of work and the amount of uh, time spent together and with family. Very oh. important, huh? Oh, the great Jenny. Yeah, there she is. That's my. <clears throat> My niece-in-law. This is there. what makes yeah, all the blood, right. sweat, and tears worthwhile is, is love of family and friends, isn't yeah. it? Well, this is where my mom spent, you know, most of her time. And we have a, a beach house in Malibu. And she decided, you know, a couple of years ago, she just wanted to spend the rest of her time down there. And she yeah. just loved the sound of the ocean and loved having family come down at any yeah. opportunity. And she's 97 there. And that was just taken a few months before she passed away. Yeah. It's incredible, huh? Yeah. And the good news is that she wasn't sick at all. She just yeah. went, went to bed one night and that was it. Did she just like uh, have dinner with friends or lunch with friends the day before or something? And then yeah, just she, lie she down, was and... down at Disney or it, it, uh, with, with uh, Gustavo Dudamel at some event on Saturday and Sunday. And she was gone on Monday. Uh, yeah. She up to yeah. the last minute, I guess she just said, uh, you know, I'm tired. Uh, onward. Yeah. Had Moving a, on. Moving had a on. couple of her traditional Bombay sapphires at yeah. around five o'clock. Had a yeah. nice dinner. And, and I mean, that's how we should all get out of here. Right? That's but I so noticed cool. you had that picture, sorry, of uh, uh, David Allen David Greer. Allen Greer, that's right. Yes. Yeah, he was one of the co-hosts of the of the Apollo show with Patty Austin, and he's so funny, and oh, so he's talented. Not people aren't really aware that he's a great Broadway singer. And, yes, uh, he is. Yes. Yeah. And they just think of him as a TV sort of comedy guy, but he's really quite talented. And yeah. lives right on the street. Yeah, he really, really yeah. is. Gloria oh, Stefan, and look at that shot, that, huh? That's uh, that's also um, that was the Gershwin, the Tony Bennett Gershwin Prize. And I'll tell you a quick story about that. Neither Gloria or Stevie were scheduled to be on the show. We had Dwight Yoakam and. Um, Girls just want to have fun. No, not her. Not uh, Cheryl Crow. Cheryl Crow. And I was in Miami, um, whatever I was doing down there. And I get a phone call. This is 10 days before we're going to tape this show. And I get a call from Dwight Yoakam's manager saying, Greg, sorry, Dwight has some health issues and he's going to have to cancel. Now, yeah, and there's like I said, there's a theme tonight. Uh, <laughs> and then, like two hours later, I get a call from Cheryl Crow's manager. Mm. She's gonna cancel, mm. and I had the two of them singing "What a Wonderful World" as a duet. Well, that night, Monica and I are out with Gloria and Emilio having dinner, and I just got her as wine filled as I could. And I said, Gloria, I need a huge favor. Is there any way you'd consider coming to DC to do it? And she said, well, I was asked to do it and I had to turn it down. Things have changed. And sure, I said, sure, I'll be there for you. And then I had called Stevie over and over and over and said, come on, man, would you please do it? And he's notorious for not returning calls. And four days before we were going to do that um, concert, my phone rings and it's Stevie. And he said, yeah, what do you want me to sing? <laughs> so I had swapped out Cheryl Crow and Dwight Yoakam for Corey Stefan and Stevie Wonder. So things they, work out. Don't they, they I was going to say that's not uh, <laughs> not a bad swap at all, huh? Not a bad swap. Mm. You know, Jim, you better watch it because for every picture you put up, there's a friggin' story a mile. Yeah, long. I'm sorry. So <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. And now we have another special yeah. guest tonight. Uh, her name is Monica Mancini. <laughs> no, this is great. These stories are fantastic, yeah. and the audience are, are loving them as well. Um, tell us again about some of the uh, extraordinary things that you guys are very, very excited about. I got to say, there's another great shot we found that we really love. This is oh, terrific. Where was this? That's up on my roof on my house. Oh, is it? It's nice. So what is it overlooked? What do you see? Well, that's the San Fernando Valley. Those that's are the, the lights of the mountains behind our house. 
Very uh, nice. Quite off in the distance. Why don't you lie and say it's like Switzerland or something? Oh, I was yeah, going to say I it's like yeah. uh, yeah. Oh, it's, picture, it's Burbank, yeah. basically. Yeah, I'm sitting on a dirty ass roof, um, <laughs> and in, like, yes. in this like multi thousand dollar dress, and I have to climb she up. She just finished vacuuming and making banana bread. <laughs> well, kinda, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> God, you're really going into the archives. Aren't the, the behind the scenes gang of, uh, wow, of the reality yeah. of it all. There was a restaurant. I was on a TV shoot in Burbank and we were filming uh, this fabulous woman that's in her mid nineties and she's a wonderful artist. She's been drawing and painting since she was two when her mother put sketch paper on the ground in the kitchen. And she's a brilliant artist. We went to her home in Burbank and there was a restaurant, I forget the name of it, in Burbank. And she said, I want to take you to this restaurant. I want to do it in the evening. And that photo of you, Monica, reminded me of sort of the view that you get. There's this restaurant in Burbank that's legendary. And you sort of go, you drive up and up and up and up and up. Oh, and it's yeah. like the top of this very tall hill. And it overlooks... You look to the right, Burbank. You look to the left, you see Los Angeles. Yeah, and yeah. it's fantastic. Oh, I and forget. I know yeah, what you're talking about. Yeah. What a fantastic place. And uh, oh. that shot almost looks a little bit. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the direction. Burbank's in that direction. That's what I, th I said. It looks yeah. sort of familiar there. Yeah. Um, remind us again of some of the extraordinary things that you guys are excited about that you do have coming up. And congratulations on all, gang. Oh, well, you know, as Greg had alluded to, we're, we're gearing up to celebrate dad's centennial, his hundredth birthday, which is going to be in 2024. And so we're as a family, um, coming up with all kinds of ways to celebrate his legacy. Um, a lot of concerts, uh, around the country, hopefully around the world. Um, some recordings we're doing some things I can't really talk about at this point at this time. But um, so that's, that's kind of what, what our family is jointly trying to getting into right now. I know Greg's got so much stuff up his sleeve. You just, here he goes. Tell, tell the people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> He's got a lot of projects. You got a few things up your sleeve, uh, Greg. Yeah. Uh, both sleeves or just one sleeve. Oh, <laughs> Every orifice actually. <laughs> Roll off maybe a couple. <laughs> um, well, all right. Um, I'm sorry. We've run out of time. Thanks for joining uh, us. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've had this weird relationship all of a sudden uh, over the last three years uh, producing Nina Simone related music. So I did her Apollo concert, celebration of Apollo concert, did a PBS special around her. Did an album last year with Lettucey, which we actually got a nomination for. It's a pretty good record. And um, turns out that um, Nina performed at Carnegie Hall in 63, basically the American songbook. And then there was horrible racial, god-awful incidents that took place between 63 and 64. And it really started to inform Nina's anger. Um, and when she went back in 64, um, she debuted Mississippi Goddamn, and a she had really focused her uh, music uh, toward, uh, you know, what was happening racially and politically in those days. So I'm working with a piano player named Laura Downs. You might know her. Sure, yeah. Laura has her own NPR special. She's an African-American classical pianist. And um, we're in talks right now. We're going to do an album. And we're going to recreate. See, Nina wanted to be a classical pianist, and she applied for Curtis, the Curtis Institute. Yeah. And she passed the audition and was summarily told, "Sorry, you're black and you're a woman. You ain't can't coming here." Ooh. And it really, yeah, it pissed her off. Sure. And so Laura is the embodiment of what Nina might have become. Yeah. So we're going to do a record of that music. And we're going to take Nina's music and we're going to reimagine it in a classical piano form. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to do it at Carnegie Hall on the anniversary of the 64 concert um, in March of 2024. You come, Jim. You come. You so, come. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, so it's there's a lot of cool things going on. Will you have that bottle of wine still with you or will that be long gone? 
<laughs> now, what, what do you think? <laughs> this is going to be gone tonight. This be gone in about an hour. Gone in an hour, but you have a phone number you could call if you need uh, reserves, right? <laughs> That's right. Why do you guys love this so much? It's obviously, you know, joyful for the two of you together, working together, uh, loving one another deeply as you do as the collaborative team, but also as uh, men and wife and partners and friends. Uh, what are some of those continued blessings and joys in your life that uh, propel you forward in doing the work you do that you do so well for the pleasure of all of us? I'll start with you, uh, Monica. What? <laughs> That's quite a mouthful. <laughs> My father has always told me I should go into comedy. I think you too. <laughs> I love that. Huh? Come again? I didn't quite hear. The Wi-Fi went out, Jim. Could you say that again? <laughs> you know, we just, um, you know, as, as you saw and you said, you know, we really just love doing what we do together. Um, we just, um, one thing COVID did for for me, and I think for a lot of people, was really kind of shift gears and kind of you had an opportunity to kind of be with yourself and just be with your life and say, wow, this is things are changing. Got to really take a look at, at how I fit into this whole thing. And um, we really want to just do things that be with the people we want to spend time with, be, you know, um, not do things we don't want to do. Um just, you know, really enjoying each other's company and family in particular, and really a, just a close circle of friends who we've, we've just, that we love spending time with. We love to travel. So, you know, we look forward to more opportunities to see the world together. And I think the only way you can really, you know, grow as a person <clears throat> is travel. I mean, I think traveling is, is, has a big part to do with how we see ourselves and how we fit into the, the, the world. And so, you know, we're always exploring. We're always saying, well, what are we going to do next? And, you know, um, anyway, so I have no idea what your question was, but does that fit in anywhere to yeah, an end? <laughs> yeah. Some of the blessings and joys in your life that continue to, I mean, you both have done so much. You could easily, I use the analogy of have your feet in the sand in Miami and a hammock with banana coladas in your hand, just saying, We've done a lot, we've done enough, but you're still out there doing and producing and creating and performing and sharing and collaborating. And some of those inspirations and joys and blessings in your life that propel you to want to still do all of that. Beautifully said, yeah. You know, I wow. think because we keep reinventing, right? Yes. Um, you know, if like when I worked for Sinatra, when he, when he hung it up, I mean, you know, it didn't get any better than that. And yeah, I could have spent the rest of my life living in that, just telling Sinatra stories and, and playing Sinatra tribute concerts. And um, that's not the life either one of us want. It's still in front of us. Uh, in fact, um, I'm deciding to take a little bit of time off uh, and I'm writing a book and it's not just anecdotal stories. There's plenty of those. People love to hear Sinatra stories, for example, but writing a book that's meaningful about, um, you know, I've had a wonderful life living in the African-American music world. And I, it gave me a different perspective on, on um, race relations. And that's really important to me. Um, and so there's a beautiful thread between having worked with a lot of artists um, and gaining information that I think is unique and worth talking about. So that, that's kind of the future right now for the next few months. Beautiful reasons for the two of you to be doing what you're doing so well and to continue doing it together. Keep us surprised on the events and the things that are going on. And, you know, I'll continue to spread the word and, and the book and all these cool things that you have coming down the, the pike. Really Thank spectacular. You. Yeah, really spectacular stuff. And somebody here that usually joins us towards the latter part, gang, that just wanted to pop in and say hello. Mr. George Burns is with us. <laughs> you almost made it to 100, George. I was going to say, he, uh, he's he got his cigar. See the cigar? Yeah. And his red hanky. And he is always on the show towards the latter part. Uh, 
I mentioned to you before I went live on the air, my mother's the youngest of 16. And one of my aunts, my mother's sisters, collected all kinds of very collectible dolls. So in his later years, she made sure she got that George Burns doll. It got passed down to me. And then I put it, I did, I think, a childhood memories, nostalgic episode of the Jim Masters show. And he popped on. And everybody fell in love with him. And now he's part of the uh, repertoire here on the show. Pops in towards the end, looks around. He's usually down here below with his cigar. And he's got a very tall martini that usually is wiped out by the time the show ends. But he said, you guys absolutely knocked it out of the park. Uh, he loves oh, you both. Sure, and sure. he wishes you continued success. Um, did you ever come across him in your travels at all? Uh, I'm sure your father had. Uh, had uh, <laughs> Gosh, you know what? I He's one of the, isn't that funny? He's one of the few people, you know, I didn't meet. Yeah. He, uh, you know, lived in the same neighborhood as, you know, Jimmy Stewart. Right. And, and uh, Lucy and Desi and all those yes. people kind of in the same neighborhood. Yeah. Jack Benny and, Jack and all. Benny, who was his, you know. Best, best friend. friend ever lived right next door to Lucille Ball and Desert. You know, there, there's this whole block of just like, like who, what? what? <laughs> and but I never, I, I met Jack Benny, but I never did meet George Burns. I don't think I did. Um, well, here he is in right spirit, and George. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well done, George and uh, Gracie. Yeah. Uh, they uh, had lunch with uh, Ginny, and they said she's very happy and feels very Aww. loved she feels very loved and uh, nice. she's Aww. in good company with uh they're having lunch i think it's george gracie your dad and Ginny today which is not a bad uh, lineup huh no. <laughs> That's hilarious. you know i would love to join that group just not yet oh could you imagine right. <laughs> that would be <laughs> I, I, she's a great director, isn't she? She's fantastic. She's just like, yeah. come on, the camera's over here. Get in there. You guys are the best. Thanks for all the time. Thanks for the great conversation. Just want to show you a couple of little loveties saying thank you for being here, Monica and Greg. Thanks for sharing your life with us. Great show. Um, and she's in New York City. Merlin's in Ontario, Canada. Thank you, too. It's been a blast. Yeah, thanks for all these great comments, guys. You are terrific. Maureen in Arizona. This was an absolutely incredible conversation. Thank you both for your time with us this evening, and welcome to the Lovety Squad. Oh, uh, listen, part of that family, absolutely. <laughs> Not bad at all, huh? Uh, spread the word about our show. If you guys know other folks you think would like to pop on, this is how we do it, Cavett style, Carson style, warm and friendly. Uh, Linda Johnson says, thank you so much. Enjoyed this so oh, much. Oh, and uh, oh. and yeah, we'll keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime. And, you know, we can, even if it's just for 20 minute chat to update us on what's going on and your things you're excited about, uh, you're always welcome back. And I'm so glad we met yes. in 1998 oh. <laughs> when I was 12 and you were 10. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. right. That's our story. And we're sticking to it. <laughs> you guys are the best. <laughs> uh, we, we really loved it. And uh, obviously you can tell your fans really love what you do. And uh, thanks for having us on. Yeah. What a, what uh, a joy. Yeah. The pleasure is all mine. As I say to all the guests, I hope the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I definitely have with the two of you tonight. Aww. Absolutely. Can't think of a better way to spend an hour and a half or so, right? How long was he talking for God's sake? <laughs> an hour and plenty of the hour oh, and a okay. half. <laughs> <laughs> well, a toast to uh, to Ginny and to uh, to Henry and to the both of you. Thanks again for joining us on the show. You truly are uh, icons, but more than that, dear people. And I really love you both. So love you too, continued success and uh, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we will be in the same zip code real soon. Okay. Hope so. I love that. All right. Hey, Cheers. Man. You take care right. now. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye now. <laughs> Incomparable Monica Mancini, Greg Field, joining us here, stopping by the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series. Was that not cool? Did you guys enjoy yourself? 
our uh, JMS Loverty chat room has been on fire all night long. There are some websites to pay attention to. We've been flashing them during the course of the show. MonicaMancini.com for all things Monica. And of course, ConcordRecords.com uh, as well. Check that out. Really, really cool. You know what's great about these conversations on our show? And you're very welcome, Pam. And uh, Crystal says, uh, thank you, Monica and Greg, for sharing your amazing story. I wish you continued success. Keep up the great work. Thank you as well for Crystal Nolan, who's watching in Connecticut. Maureen says, now that was a load of fun. What lovely people Monica and Greg are. I concur. Absolutely. And uh, Linda says, uh, thank you, Jim. They were so much fun, weren't they? Great sense of humor. They rolled with it. Wherever direction we went, they rolled with it, which I think was really, really cool. Um, really, really terrific people. And all these great stories, too. You know, some of you might uh, been, have been watching because you loved Henry Mancini's work and still do. Some of you because of Monica. Some of you know Greg or all of the above. But uh, they're really, really cool people, aren't they, uh, Monica? You got the story behind this? You got the story behind that? <laughs> and, of course, picking up a couple of Grammys here, well-deserved. We're talking Greg and, and Monica. They love what they do. They've been doing it a long time. And what's so beautiful about it is that they get to do it together, huh? Uh, a lot of this work, they get to do it together. And uh, this really was a great conversation. Uh, it just flowed so beautifully. That's how we do it. We don't script anything. We just go with it. And uh, Sherry Larson says, uh, thank you, Jim, for another fantabulous evening. They are absolutely wonderful, aren't they? You are very welcome, Sherry Larson, watching in Kansas, USA. Check them out, all the music online. You know where to go to find out all the music. Great stories about uh, Sinatra, huh? And uh, Ella, and so much more. Really, really cool. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Now, of course, uh, we've got a lot of amazing guests coming up. If you want to know, uh, just subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's Gym Masters TV that helps the show grow. Just click that red subscribe button. There's no cost to do that. And click the notification bell so you never miss any of our episodes. And also, as we always say here at the Gym Master Show Live. If you enjoyed this episode and all the ones, some 730 you can binge watch, give us a thumbs up like. There's a little thumbs up icon on the YouTube channel for all the episodes. Give it a thumbs up. Make sure you click the up thumb. <laughs> Very important. And leave a comment for us as well. We're going to be back tomorrow night. Uh, more great guests coming. Uh, Ava Cherry, she's going to be with us on Wednesday. We just had Melba Moore with us recently and so many other great guests. Thank you, Jim. This was great from Kathleen in New York City. You are very, very welcome. We don't say goodbye here. We say see you later. We say hasta la vista. Ciao, slancha, cheers, moi loop, which in African you know means walk well. We say uh, sayonara, hasta la vista, but we do not say goodbye. We say, be well, take care, love one another, be good to one another. Uh, Maureen says, wishing you, Jim and Lovities, far and wide, a wonderful rest of your day and night. Tight Lovity hugs coming at you. Thank you, Maureen in Arizona. And uh, everybody watching, regardless of what time it is you watch our show, we thank you for being here. And again, love one another, take care of one another, be good to one another, and don't forget to love yourself. It's very important to save some of that love for yourself as well. This is Jim Masters thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, I'll be here waiting for you on the next episode, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific tomorrow. For those watching live, those watching Memorex, you're watching this later on, stick with us. Another episode of the Jim Masters Show Live series comes up in just a moment. For all of us, thanks for being with us. Take care and cheers.